town of Cheran, a town that was tired of the abuse from the cartels and the local police and the politicians. So they armed themselves and threw them away of, of the town and now they're ruling themselves. This is a very interesting story that captivates the minds of many people and I think dissolves this notion that there would be total chaos if there was no government. There haven't been any homicides, kidnappings and murders here for a very long time. The government was uh, really ruining the environment. They were doing a lot of logging that was just destroying the area. There was a lot of murders, a lot of extortion, a lot of kidnapping here. This area has been actually anarchist now for about 10 years. When the uprising movement was taking place, there was a member of the uprising that was receiving any cartel member that was getting inside of the town. He was receiving them with sniper gunshots to repel them right from this same spot. We, we just lived under fear. It was not just the group, our local government was working with them. We couldn't go out of town, we were besieged, besieged inside of the community. So we also had a lot of murder, so it, it really hurts to, to remember that, those times. Nobody had done anything, so that day a group of women started this whole thing they stood up against a convoy. The women were the head in stopping the loggers, the ones that were harming all of our Puripicha plateau. And men, women, and children got together. We didn't have any weapons to defend ourselves, but in any way we could, with sticks, machetas, and even rocks. That's how we could stop the loggers that harmed us so much. We went out with machetes, low caliber guns, a couple of 22s, that's all we had in that moment. And well, it was hard acquiring the proper tools. And thank God everything is more peaceful over here. All the community got together and they started kicking all the bad people here in Cheran and they didn't let nobody come in here no more. What we can see over here are the cars of the criminal loggers. The people during the uprising, they stopped the loggers, took them out of the cars, and then in their anger, they were beating the cars with uh, machetes and sticks and whatever they had in their hands. And in their anger, they also burned them. They went back to an, an, an ancient uh, form of government, which nowadays we have. Ever since, I have felt much more secure. You can see our, our kids playing outside in the street. The feeling of being independent is priceless. It's one of the projects that the community has is to build its own economy. I guess one of the alternatives uh, would be, you know, cr cryptocurrency. As you can see, the rangers are formed to take care of the flora and the fauna, of all of the resources from here, from Cheran. All the resources from here, what is Cheran. So normally they, they don't have any trouble, just some invaders from the other towns, but that's it, and they just uh, take them out. The surrounding communities know Cheran as a witchcraft town. They have a, a specific name. Shikwamis is the word, which means the witches. So normally they expected rains on May the 15th, which it was the exact day in which the rain arrived. But because of the deforesting that took place in the area, the, the rain was constantly delayed. 
especially these past few years the rain has been delaying so they they come over here and ask that stone over there for water and rain what they're telling me every time they're in the need to do that the water arrives people in the community that dedicate their lives to spirituality they come here to receive energy from the stars and the skies I have lived in other places. I have lived in Miami, North Carolina, in the States. I had never felt that, that safe. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. It's the common sense solution towards a lot of the problems that the world is facing right now. Uh, whatever problem you're facing, it should be decided on a community level, not by someone sitting on top. When you have a local decentralized power network, people will care about the fellow people. My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? by only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CatMuff, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CatMuff, because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the SNLS Network, SomeNextLevelPodcast.com, The Conscious Resistance Network, The Voluntary Virtues Network, and SOLPodcast.org. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at BIPCOT.org. So today I'm delighted to have Chris Harrigan, who is a documentary filmmaker and voluntarist. He's coming in from New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, you can find his, uh, his, his contact information on Facebook under Chris Harrigan, H-A-R-R-I-G-A-N, and also the um, Facebook page for his upcoming uh, documentary, Anarchopocalypse. Um, I'll put that link in the description. Don't worry about spelling it. <laughs> and uh, he's also oh, oh, there, he also has links on Patreon, the um, the Patreon for the uh, documentary, uh, patreon.com slash xhrgn. And and then also, his, so I'm going to put documentary uh, links to documentaries, the Healing with Cannabis documentary, Tripping with Lee uh, about ayahuasca, and then... Um, and the Anarcho Apocalypse, um, the the Patreon uh, page for for the for the documentary, and uh, yeah, links for those as well in the description. Um, and we're going to talk about his path to volunteerism and what inspired him to become a, a documentary filmmaker, and and uh, you know why he chose this path to go along, um, which uh, seems like is becoming more and more. Uh, truth telling as he's getting older. I guess that's what happens when you get older. You just you you lose the BS, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah, like to think so, eh? Right. So, uh, so yeah. So, Chris, uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. I first heard about you on uh, Jeff Berwick uh, Mannercast um, when you talked about your documentary and your experience in Chilean Mexico. And um, you know, I talked to um, Roy Duarte about. Chiran and got his perspective, and uh, and so you you're you have a different perspective since you're going to make a documentary about it. So, so I'm like I'm like why not uh, talk to the man himself who's going to actually do a, an awesome piece of footage about it. So that's why I got you on. Um, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, trying to help you out because I know uh, it's difficult, you know, putting out you know this kind of content and um, 
you know, when you're looking for funding. Uh, so we're doing all we can to help put the word out. Well, that's good. Thank you very much. That's uh, it's very much appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So before we get into that, if you can uh, talk about your past and how you came to the ideas of volunteerism and anarchism. Um, okay. Well, I guess it goes way back to school um, and just growing up. Uh, I think I've always been an anarchist. I think and as I was growing up, more and more, just the, the layers that were put upon me were being peeled away just as I got more intelligent. And uh, then I just got fed up with high school, really, in grade 10 and left. And later decided that uh, I just didn't want to, you know, just be a high school dropout. So I went back, I got my credits, and I went to university. And I was taking uh, psychology, which I thought, you know, that was a really cool thing, like, uh, you know learning how the mind works and how people, you know, I thought that'd be a good way to go. But where I actually found, and I, and I didn't like it. Like I, I after my first year in, I, I actually worked in the industry. I worked with schizophrenics. I worked with multiple personalities as a counselor. And uh, but really I was just a glorified babysitter and handing out pills. I just was, I was very disenchanted with the entire process of what I was seeing, how people were treated but what I had taken as minor is philosophy. <laughs> and the next year, uh, my second year, I just really went all out philosophy. Like I, I just it took as much as I could, could and really enjoyed it. One of, and, and one of the uh, assignments was to make a film on liberty. And that, <laughs> that just changed the course of my life because my friend was working uh, for a television station and saw it and was like, dude, you're missing your calling. Like, this is what you ought to be doing. And I really liked it. And I felt really in my element. Um, and this is when I discovered what anarchy is, was in those, that year, really, when I was kind of looking for a way to think, you know, like you're, 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 you know, some things made sense to me. And so, you know, I'm from Canada, so socialism and all this stuff, you know, you know, things should be taken care of. And, and, you know, I don't think that way no more. <laughs> right. But uh, I, I was so influenced by the idea of just that was the way to go. You know, well, you just don't need any real rulers. Like, I mean, you just need the golden rule and, you know, maybe uh, in basic law, common law, maybe, you know, like just don't kill, don't steal, don't create fraud in a contract. Don't. Now, how you take the care of those things, that's another matter. But I like the idea so much. I actually, that was my first tattoo. It's on my. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I quit school because I was so influenced by the film thing. Uh, and also just like it was powerful. So I, you know, I kind of felt the, I liked, I liked everything about it. And the whole time I was in university, I, I'm visual. So I was like, why are you guys making me read all these books? And, you know, in the sense that like what I meant by that was there's documentaries on every one of these things that you're talking about, I'm sure. Or at least, and if there isn't a shot, there ought to be. <laughs> You know, like, don't show me, show me, you know, don't, don't make me read it and repeat it. And really it never sinks in. And, mm. you know, remember in school, the smart kids were the ones that just memorized everything. Right. Well, I, and I was the kid that, you know, I, I need to know, like, you need to give me the proper answers and stuff, and, you know? Uh, and the, yeah, so I quit and then, and I went into television I took the two year course and, uh, and, Really right away went into documentaries. I worked in, for my first discovery uh, series, like a my first year out, and then it just kind of went from there. And I've been doing that ever since. And you know, you would feel that okay, that you're you're accomplished. That's what you want to be doing. Like you know, you, that's the top of the rail in the sense of like mainstream media. Okay, you're working for Discovery Channel. Or you're doing that. Or, and uh, but there was. It's not like the whole working in television. Also, I worked for news. Like I really did the gambit. I tried to get as big a skill set I, I could. And when you would do work in documentaries and stuff, I remember working on one about uh, Middlevert Dora and uh, Werner von Braun, who was the you know the the rocket scientist that created the V two rockets. Also, mm. the creator of NASA, mm. who came in under Project Paperclip. And yeah, like the United, uh, out of all the shows, like all the shows from this particular series were sold internationally, but that particular show, they would, they refused to buy. You know, there's just those little things. But then also within making the documentaries, 
uh, you hear the backstories of the things that are not putting on air. Those are much more interesting stories, you know. But you do have to appease the broadcaster. You can't go too far. Mm. The broadca- it's broadcasters appeasing the uh, um, advertisers, and you know, so there, there's kind of a quiet censorship all the way down. And so that that kind of led into more, I guess, less mainstream stuff, right? Like the first one was the the healing with cannabis. What would you say? That was... I would say it happened to me all at once. Uh, yes, it was that, and it was uh, uh, almost like a wall. I think maybe a lot of us felt it. It was right, you know, around two thousand nine, two thousand ten. The stock market crash just happened. A lot of people are starting to. You know, those zeitgeist movies that come out, Loose Change, and all those things, I believe, were out by then, maybe. And people are just kind of, you know, beginning to, and so was I. You know, so when I heard about these things, in, uh, right away, and I did you know, I went out as a, as a one-man crew, like, you know, with no budget. And, but felt compelled to have to make this. And the same thing happened this time around with the... Uh, uh, an archipelago is really like a, it's 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 a it starts at the conference. It starts at the uh, an archipelago conference, really, with all the brightest minds of the day, mm. you know. And it, and we go all the way to Toronto. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's almost like you know, let's talk about these <clears throat> concepts that most people aren't even comfortable talking about you know, living without government or without police or mm. you know. And we begin that the the movie talking about those but what we ended with is demonstrating it we spent a week there me and roy spent a week there uh with jacob uh uh still i don't want to miss say his name J- jacob stoller like he, he's from denmark and he was also you know a great big part of this trip and uh and uh it was incredible because we went back we went with we went with luke Radowski and we went with jeff yeah but we were so impressed that I, you know, I wound up staying in Acapulco for another month. Mm. Uh, we came to come back two weeks later, and we spent a week there. And uh, there is something that's beyond words. Like you know, I've watched the BBC things. I've watched the, uh, I think Vice and Al Jazeera. I even think maybe, what, but they're always talking about the uprising of these people, right? Mm. And it started with the women, but. Really, it's the heart of the people that really started. To, it's that getting to know that was really, you know, that was that was uh, really important for me for really to, for it to sink in to actually be in the town and think about what it was like. And you know, they were sniper. They were sniping from the roofs and hmm. using using whatever they had. It was, but this is the most peaceful town I've ever been to. Hmm. Right, you know, right. but I'm walking down the street and there goes a horse guy on a horse fly by, you know, like you don't see that anywhere. Else. <laughs> this is like kind of a regular town, you know, like, <laughs> you know, well, it is a regular town. Yeah. It's yeah. So it's quite, it was, it was, that, it was quite an experience for sure. So, but that's, so what, that's what led me into like, I, once I got a taste of telling, you know, one to tell the truth about, very simply and without complications and without, uh, but there's no money in that, and that's what's difficult. So, right, to try to balance them too. So it it's um yeah you know, it's a regular town you say so it, it there is an elder but he's not like what we would consider like a politician right it's, it's and there's no what, what, and nothing what we would think of as a state that that you know with coercive power right no, so well, it, there's it, there's elders right. There's elders, there's a, there's a bunch of elders, yeah, and it's really the it's the community that more or less uh, uh, offers the job right. to who they think would be best for their community for that one thing. But here, I find that the jewel of this is when that person accepts, he's not paid. The community takes care of him mm. during his term. Wow, <laughs> interesting. That's what, that was my understanding. If I'm wrong about that, I really don't. Think that's was what I understood. That it, and if they don't get, if they do get paid. It's much less than they're used to. Like it's, they mm. need the, the community has to be involved, and in, so you better do a good job. Right, right, right. <laughs> and there's a council. There's no, you know, each there's because there's a uh, uh, there's neighborhoods. I think I believe it's four neighborhoods, right? Mm-hmm. 
and each one of them has an equal say in the council and the, and the entire council have to, has to agree. Like they went, this is an ancient form of government that, that they've had to bring back because they didn't know what to do either. They kicked the government out. They were like, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> you know, like, what do we do? So somehow instinctively they went back to this. Yeah. I mean, as, um, you know, as a volunteerist, I always talk to people about, you know, when I describe what volunteerism is and what the state is, I always start with the individual. You know, I say that you have these rights of uh, self-ownership, of property rights, and and non-aggression, right? Which is the right to not be aggressed against, right? And if we apply those universally, then you must apply those even to the politician. And so that means that the politician and anybody working for the state does not have rights that you do not have, right? And so if that's the case, they cannot do something that if the average individual did something would have been a, would be a crime, right? Because if you did, if they did, then it would be a double standard, it would be hypocrisy, right? So contradiction in terms. So so that's one of the ways that I logically um, dismantle the state, you know, and and that's kind of what it seems like these people are doing in that in that nobody has rights that you know everyone else doesn't have. Yeah, but uh, yes, and I'll add to that that what you just said there was really, that was a really big hitting point for me because I think it was the second day we, we were there, they wanted to know us. Mm -hmm. So they invited us in like to a kind of a private meeting to mm -hmm. to tell us what they were all about. They showed us a slideshow about their, their, their plan for the community in the future and all these things. Mm -hmm. And one of the last slides really hit me like a ton of bricks because it was a, it was a diagram. Well, it was, it was a nice, like, almost like a painting there, but it starts really with the individual. Yeah. Okay. And then it spiraled out to the family, mm. the community, and outwards all the way to, you know, as big as you want to make it, I guess. Um, but <laughs> really, in, in every which way I hear about politics and this and that and the other thing, what I've come to conclude is I don't care what system you put in place. It doesn't matter if it doesn't come from the individual himself. You know, the individual, each individual. If, if we're not, if if we're each and every one of us not governing ourselves, being responsible for ourselves, and learning, you know, and and helping each other, realizing that as a community we're stronger. All these things, the basic things. I mean, it's got to start with the root, because mm. otherwise the system is the nanny. Call it what you will. It is. <laughs> <laughs> It's the mentality itself is the nanny, uh, it, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, in some sense, people look to the state to be their protector, you know, be their father figure, or in, in other senses, people look to the state to be their nurturer, caregiver, you know, the nanny state and protect every, you know, uh, take care of every little detail, <laughs> eliminate eliminate risk from people's lives, and you know, provide that safety net, but. Um, but then, you know, you have to think about at the expense of what? Where does the state get all these resources? And uh, and the truth is that the state steals and plunders the resources. <laughs> so in in the end, your, your uh, you know, father figure or mother figure that comprises the state is really the most aggressive element in your life, you know? Um, but people, mm -hmm. don't, people don't recognize it as such. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was talking, sorry, when I was talking about, you know, we were talking about uh, healing cancer with cannabis, that film, and what led to it. The part of the real big thing I forgot to mention was this entire industry here relies on the tax credit. The entire industry in Canada is like, it's government run. Right. Okay. That's, that's the way it is. If you want money for a show, you're somehow, or unless you're dealing with the states and then it's all different. Mm -hmm. um, but they went back on a promise. Uh, that they would never, uh, they wouldn't even look at that tax credit was solid for the next, I don't know, until 2017. This was 2010. They just broke the promise and, and just cut the tax credit. And overnight, my entire province was out of work, including me. Hmm. And uh, that, uh, that gave me the time to do this. And then slowly things started trickling back. And, but it never really got better, not even close. Um, so, and then I, because of that, I was working a lot out of Halifax still, 
and a you know a, a, a famous show called The Trailer Park Boys. Uh, this opportunity was coming up, and I was going to get to work on this, and I was really excited about. And one of my friends worked on it, and uh, and <laughs> sure enough, man, the week before I go, they cut the tax credit for that <laughs> for that province. However, the show went on, and we did do the season. Hmm. But it was like it was, after that was just an exodus. It was just like being, and that was a mecca here in Canada. There's Vancouver, Toronto, and Halifax, hmm. and and a lot of a lot of them, more than you'd ever imagine. American movies are are made there because they get that tax credit. You yeah. know, it's worth it's worth it. So they come here. Hmm. All right. Yeah, yeah. So I think Margaret Thatcher says socialism works until you run out of other people's money, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like uh, it's like there's a cartoon, you know, that depicts socialism, which is like, you know, one person asks for money from this, you know, person A asks money from person B, so person B, you know, his hand is in person C's pocket, taking his money. <laughs> and well, give... I wonder, yeah, like I mean. If... There's uh, Jacob, the guy that was with us. He said one thing that it really has become one of my favorite quotes. And uh, I mean, on whatever level you want, there has to be rules. There's mm -hmm. there's rules. There's rules to boil an egg. You can't you know you can't boil an egg without rules. <laughs> so there are basic rules, you know that as a you know. But as far as socialism and all these kind of big handouts and all these things, yeah. I mean, would it, would you really need it if the community took care of that? Because I live in New Brunswick, and I mean, there's a lot of, I've grown up in, around small communities. This is what I know. Fishermen, farmers, you know, we got it all here. Like, you can go to, in the in, in the, the hills and mountains and the gullies and all that with the hillbillies or whatever, but it's all here, man. Like, you know, yeah. I know all these people. I know all this way. And that's also what formed me into just the way I think, because you, as soon as you're away from town and then you know you're away from the police and that's where we go to party and that's where we go to get away and feel free. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that was all part of it. Uh, yeah, I forget what I was saying now, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, I mean, do, do you see Canada as um, progressively, you know, increasing the. Uh... You know the the grip of socialism, like more, oh, in terms yeah. of more no, taxes. No, no. Listen, what I see in Canada is the grip of globalism. That, like, honestly, I don't see Canada anymore. The Canada I knew growing up is no more. Mm. Does not exist. Right. And the only place I felt a part of it, a part of that, was when I went back when I was in Mexico. And you know, we are in like remote places, like these little towns and stuff. But how do I explain this? It was it was remembering what it was like to be the kid in the back of the pickup. You know, like uh, just everybody's outdoors. The families are outdoors. Nobody's right. inside. It's, right, a, it's right. and you know when we were kids, we were building camps in the woods. We were out in the streets. That's where could kids play. Get out of the house. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, my kid, like I live in a suburb. I don't really see that. You don't see that no more. You know. Right. right. And it's not just the video games. It's not just all these things. It's these mentality. You know, you don't, even me, I don't feel safe with my, you know, like, because I'm a victim of programming also, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know. I, I catch myself doing things all the time. It's like, well, wait, it's, what, this is ridiculous. That's normal for a kid. It's what a kid does, you know what I mean? <laughs> but not here in Canada anymore. You don't see a kid out the street playing ever. Like, really. Like, I mean, you do. Like, but not, not, not like. Not like we did ball hockey and everything, street hockey and just yeah. BMXs. <laughs> BMX. Yeah, my uh, my kids are eight and six, and uh, for that very reason that you said that you don't see kids on the streets anymore, that's exactly why I tried to find other families um, to meet up with in you know like um, parks and and woods you know woodsy areas, forests, and just let the kids run free and roam free and just play in the woods and they love it you know it's like it's like um the kids never get tired you know you, you know when you give a kid a toy or a game or something eventually they get tired of it right and they want to move something different but when they're in the woods they they, they play until they're exhausted <laughs> i know? did you know I did. right like we played until we, you know we play catch and until the until you just couldn't see and it's right. all dangerous at that point you know, <laughs> we had to catch. almost give up like you know. yeah 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 <laughs> So yeah, that's um, then that's exactly why we do that because um, you're surrounded by 
by you know even other people who they see a child without a parent they think there's something wrong and they'll probably call you know, right. the police or somebody you know some other uh, government agent <laughs> No, I've been away from Canada enough in the last few years to, you know, like to see, like to see everything a lot more clearly than I used to, and I don't like it here. I, and that's a real shame because I love the area, mm. I love the people. It's nothing to do with that. And you know, like a lot, the, I hate to tell you, but I mean, the last place I'd want to go really is, is the states, almost because it's that times ten. I mean, mm. probably at least you know, like that's the last time I was in the states, I got arrested. That's. <laughs> You know, hmm. for speeding, but they threw me in jail, and I was only nineteen, I think. Yeah, wow. Wow. you know, cuffed me hard. I think that like it was just a real experience there, and it's like what the, you know, because it's not that bad here in Canada back then, and now they're getting worse and they're catching up. Oh. Uh, and I, you know, and I know I know police, and I know you know the police are good people, and I don't generalize anything. Yeah, but what I see is a dark cloud happening. You know, like what we're seeing in Paris and and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the people are revolting, and it's happening here in Canada. I don't know if you do about it because it's probably not in the news, but it's mm -hmm. happening all over the place. The Yellow Jacket thing's here too. Hmm. People are fed up, and there's a lot of things happening with Trudeau right now. And the, I mean, if you ever want to see the baby face of a globalist, you know, there you are. I mean, he's. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice here. I really am because I don't like. I, I don't see those people for any more than just a puppet. I try to explain to people all the time that. Because maybe I've worked in television and I've, I, for a long time, like I've been, I've seen this man. Like, it's a show. It's mm -hmm. a show. The news is a show. Everything's a show. They get the narratives in the morning. The journalists go upstairs and they go in a glass room and they get the talking points from Toronto and, you know, and and the show. I've been a part of. I've seen when stories have been run halfway through the day. We found out they weren't true. We ran them anyway. Mm -hmm. Time slot had to be filled. It's a show. <laughs> you know. Yeah, like I hear everybody going. On, like I said it today. When I hear people going on about uh, mainstream issues, all I hear is a bunch of people uh, on a boat arguing about how fast it's sinking. Because <laughs> you know, if you really think Trump's in charge, I, I don't. You know, like I, to me, the script is too good. He's a reality TV guy. He's just it's a, it's. I'm worried about like when I when I look at everything that's going on in the world right now, the script is just too good. Yeah, it's too well scripted, and so even I worry even about the yellow jacket stuff and all these things that you know are are you know are we just being all played at, at the same time? Like are you know are forces shifting in the world? Is it, is this all pre planned? I don't know. You know. Like, so, Chris, uh, you, you might be right. There might be a dark crowd looming over these um, these nations, states. But but you got one thing wrong. Uh, you know, I, the most important thing is Trump is sexist. Okay, that's the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> because that, that <laughs> <laughs> because that seems to be what's on most people's minds. You know, the way he treats women. Right, that's the most important thing to focus on. <laughs> <laughs> what I see, uh, and uh, you know, I hope you don't get blasted with comments for this. But really, what I see from like a producer's point of view, or you know, I see somebody who's you know saying all the exact right things to piss off his opposers. Like you know, you couldn't be more on the ball with that. <laughs> right. But doing enough good little thing, good stuff, you know, like legalization of hemp and. Pulling out of Syria, if you think that's a good thing, I, you know, I'm just not for war. So I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there he, enough good things that his the validate his supporters. Mm. So then you get these two fighting in a nonstop fight because they're both right. Yeah, you know what I mean. So that's what I try to point out. It's like you have a reality TV star as a president. Just <laughs> let that sink in. <laughs> he's doing his job and he's doing it well. Like. <laughs> Yeah, it's who he's acting for that you ought to be concerned about, you know. When I when I think about you know when people are uh, complaining about the president, he's not my president, you know. It's uh, I miss Obama. He was so much nicer, so much better with <laughs> so much better with words, you know. Yeah, I think talking about that is like is like talking about changing the hood ornament on a car that's like racing off a cliff. <laughs> that's kind of the, kind of the way the significance of who's in charge, you know. 
when uh, you know when the next bubble pops you know let's say when the college loan bubble when the when the when the petrodollar collapses you know it's it's not it's really uh fundamentally not going to matter who who's sitting on the throne <laughs> no and i don't i'm not saying it smugly either because i mean these things like i mean like i say it just looks too it too picture perfect you know oh it all could just work the way they've always told us, you know, like, oh, tomorrow, and then the economy crashes, then this gets moved into place, then martial law, and I don't know, you know, mm. like, but it does look like the stage is set. The stage is set, the writing's on the wall. Like, I, if yeah. people don't just wake up and, and, and maybe the LS movement will do that, you know, like all the, you know, if people don't wake up, I mean, it's either we wake up or social credit system. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so so let me let me ask you for one uh, clarification because I think um, most people when they see the word um, anarcho apocalypse, I mean, I mean, I guess anarchism is confusing number one for most people, but the word apocalypse, uh, I assume you you're using it in different context than what most people think, right? So if you can, can you just d describe what you mean when you say those two words? Well, at the beginning of the promo, I put the definitions right there. Oh, excellent, I, excellent, good. <laughs> yeah, like the first thing I hit you with, because I know it's the first thing I'm going to question. This right, 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 right. <laughs> but uh, anarchy, as you know, it just means it means no rulers. Right. Agree, you know? right. And apocalypse is actually uh, the unveiling of truth. That's what it meant. And one thing I find interesting, you know, somebody may have an answer for this, and, you know, but if you didn't have the word anarchy to mm -hmm. describe not being ruled just that word i'm an anarchist i choose not to be ruled i choose well i guess you're going to say voluntarist but really what word would the average person have right like mm. why did they demonize it mm. right. why is it demon i don't say they maybe we demonize ourselves i don't know but why did why did it get demonized if that's really what it meant mm. and uh you know i've heard jeff Burrow say before uh that lord of the rings was an uh that uh, what's the guy's name? J.R.R. Tolkien was right, an right, anarchist, and the whole right. thing's just like an allegory. You know, yeah, that. yeah. Um. So anarchy, uh, yeah. I just those two words just married together, probably because I wasn't an anarchist. So, and uh, yeah, I just shot it at Jeff when I said I think I th and and he just bounced it back. He was like, I love it. And I was like, Yeah, I like it too. And I just made up a word. <laughs> what was that? You know? <laughs> Nice, nice. <laughs> so, so that's that's just that's the title I like, and that's the one I, you know, I could have called it "The Road to Liberty" or something, mm. or you know, but because uh, uh, this particular film is not all about Tehran. Like, in fact, like uh, I was missing some pieces, and that's what led me back to uh, not missing. I could have made a documentary just with the interviews I got at an art photo, but. I really wanted to take it full circle. Um, I didn't really go after the anarchist side of things at, at Arcapoco. I was more interested in the people that I was talking to. And of course, it all filters in. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, I don't have to say, like, what do you feel about anarchism? Like, their answer generally reflects what they think about you know, anarchism. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the one that threw everybody off was, uh, where do you think we're going to be in 10 years? You know, I want you to know how to answer that. But... Here I have this, uh, this all the greatest minds of our times, in my opinion, you know, are a great deal of them right there. And one, you know, I have that, and that could be a documentary on its own. Mm -hmm. However, the na the next natural question is, okay, you say no government, you say no this, you say no that, you say, oh, we should all jump over to cryptocurrency and get rid of fiat, and okay, blockchain, okay, all right, show me it work, show me how no government could work. You know, mm -hmm. so initially I wanted to go to Lieberland is where I wanted to go because I didn't know about Sharar. Mm -hmm. So I was going to, you know, thought I got a hold of it. J J uh, I think I saw the guy runs Lieberland. Right, right, right. The guy with Planet the Plague. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but instead, uh, out of the blue, somebody with a blockchain company, um, contacted me and was like listen i you know i i'd like to be a part of this and um i'm not sure where to mention them because i don't know where they are as far as the company right now uh, uh and so i'm just gonna let it i'm not gonna mention it because it, i haven't been in contact and i'm hoping you know i think everything's going 
great. Okay. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't, I think maybe their, their direction has changed. Right. So, mm. uh, where it's going to fall in the film, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but the, the, definitely, a, you know, uh, a, a cool blockchain based company, um, that wanted to spread a free market to, uh, truck, you know what I mean? To be able to include them in, in a world market. Mm this blockchain base and stuff like that. Like, you know, that and, and, and introduce uh, dash probably as a cryptocurrency. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, this just kind of fell out of, uh, like fortune struck, you know? So I went down and, uh, and I got there and he was in, uh, the, that company was like, Hey, uh, we're going to Sharon or you, you know, we're bringing you with us. Like, so it all just, that was that I needed that to, sh to make the full circle in the film, you know, to, to show anarchy in action, if, you know, and I really, it's just for a lack of a better word. I mean, it's just, it was just a really nice, um, the feeling you get when you're there is, is it, you've, you've forgotten it. I almost can guarantee you, you've forgotten it. Anybody listening, I guarantee you've forgotten it because we all commented on it, you know, and we all, there's, there's no police there. Hmm. Yeah. There's no government there. <laughs> you get to a checkpoint and the only thing they're looking for is whether or not you're from the government. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> or, or from a cartel right. or a uh, or police. And if you are, you're not getting in. That's it. Right. right. You're not kidding. Like, they're I, staying there with machine guns. You're not getting in. They're, you know? Yeah, they're, they're well armed, right? Yeah. And they got the Rangers. And, I mean, we were we had 20 armed guards with us on our last day to bring us through the mountains to the sacred sites and everything. Wow. Uh, because they, it, it, it gets ambushed. You know, but they want to show us these places. And, and now, not so much no more. But it does, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, they take, that's what they do. They take care of the... I don't know. I just saw a beautiful thing, but where I saw it was that it was all linked back to the roots and how connected they are to the forest around them, because that's what set the whole thing off. Mm -hmm. These people aren't like you know. I I'm in a, a a fairly rural part of the world, and I consider myself pretty connected to the. Not like this. Not mm -hmm. like this. Not like where somebody'd rather you cut their arm off than cut that tree down <laughs> wow. you know right yeah so the uh the idea you mentioned that um you know you're at anarcho and uh, everyone's talking about you know without rulers and anarchism and stateless societies and and you're like the next question is um show me show me an example right so what i uh what i tell people when they ask me that um that and that's true that it's 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 uh, helpful when you do have an example like Chiran, maybe like Liber Liber Liberland, uh, when you can show them how it's working in a particular place. But the way I look at it, it's that's not even necessary to me, because um, number one, um, you know, look at any kind of progress in human history. Every every progress, by definition of it being progress, is unprecedented. <laughs> you know, so when abolitionists came on the scene and said, you know what, maybe we shouldn't own slaves. And then the slave master says, oh, yeah, well, show me a society that works without slaves. <laughs> and I'm sure the abolitionists at that time would be hard pressed to find a working society because there really wasn't one. Maybe, you know, obscure villages. But but for the most part, every single society at that time recognize slavery is just part of life you know but that doesn't make it right right that doesn't usurp universal morality and you so, talk like it went away or something like <laughs> <laughs> well cha uh, we'll say chain slavery chain slavery. <laughs> right, right, okay, okay. <laughs> so so that's one reason and, you know like think of you know during uh you know before cell phones right and and then you know steve jobs comes you know i have this idea for a cell phone cordless and they're like what Show me it. Show me where the, the cell phone was made, and it was, 
it was a, it was a, a success. He's like, exactly. Nobody ever made it. I'm talking about making the first one. <laughs> so progress is by definition unprecedented. So the idea that there has to be something working for people to accept it, to me, is irrelevant. And... And the other thing no, is, it's, it, it's it, nice to be able to show it. Though. It is you nice. No, it is nice. You're right. <laughs> oh, of course, it is nice, definitely. But, but to me, it, it doesn't doesn't really follow it. But and the other thing is that I don't subscribe to these ideas because I see a society that's well functioning without a state. You know, that's not the reason that I'm a voluntarist or an anarchist. The reason that I'm a voluntarist is because I accept these as moral, universal truths, right? So it doesn't matter. If in my entire lifetime I'll, I'll never see a stateless society, that doesn't make my beliefs wrong, right? That just means that maybe people have not progressed <laughs> to the level where they can develop a society that way. But you know, it's like it's like um, morality, right and wrong, is not a numbers game, right? If like a hundred people say, you know, five uh, two plus two is five, it doesn't change mathematics, right? Mathematics is not, you know, it's not democracy. You know, you vote, you know, you vote for <laughs> five, two, two plus two to equal five and what? hundred people vote and it's going to be. No, no, there's certain types of rules, right? We, Like you mentioned, there's rules how to boil an egg, right? There's certain types of rules that are unchangeable. And to me, that's what morality is, unchangeable, universal rules. And um, and so that's why I'm a voluntarist. But of course, you know, the existence of Chiran and your documentary is, you know, is helping the case, you know, is helping spread the message as well. So I am grateful for that. <laughs> but I just want to put that out there. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. 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 Uh... So. <laughs> well, well said. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I get that question a lot. You know, people's like, well, show me where it works. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, just take any, any, you know, before there was cars, there was horse and carriage. And then somebody's like, you know what? Let's make something that that can move us without horses. And they're like, show me where that's ever been done. <laughs> and you're like, of course it's never been done. That's why I'm saying I'm going to be the first one. Yeah. And I think it's going to work. But, yeah. you know, if you go by that rule, which is show me where it's been done, then progress will never happen. It will never yeah. be achieved. Right. So that's not the metric for whether something, you know, principle or moral or moral rule should be accepted, right? Whether it's been done before. No, 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 no sure. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, well, especially if you just suffered, who would you even have to defend it to? It's like, look, I'm just governing myself. So, uh, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't even have to argue the point, you know, in a sense uh, yeah. of your ideology. You know, like, yeah, anyway, I, I totally understand what you said. Yeah, if it's progress, I mean, you don't need to. It's 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 an idea. Before you have to have the idea before you can make it a reality in right. the first place. Exactly, you know? exactly, exactly, and and that's exactly why when I talk to people about volunteerism and what the state is, I don't really talk about specific edicts, specific laws, taxes, regulations, or you know what this president did, what that president did. You know, I don't. I, the, to me, that doesn't matter. You know, it, to me, I'd more focus on morality, philosophy, economics. You know individual action and responsibility to me that's so much more important than focusing on the um you know obscure and you know uh insignificant minutia that comprises the state <laughs> you know because we're all bombarded with all these little tiny detailed laws and regulations that um you know it, that th that's that's the noise that's the distraction you know, so what people really have to focus on is the idea of statism. You know, the idea that that some people believe that because they are elected, they have special rights that other people do not have. That they can do actions that, if done by a private individual, would be a crime. That's what people should be focusing on. That's the most, to me, that's what the most important thing. So, yeah. I'll tell you, growing up, none of that stuff impressed me, not whatsoever, in, in the sense that, I've treated everybody I've ever met the same. I've right. never been able to grasp that concept mm -hmm. of entitlement in that sense. I, I just, I, I, you know what I mean? Like I, 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 I don't, I don't understand it. I, I know it's not necessary. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe you know. I just, is it something we're bringing over from? in tribal like, like it's just 
Yeah, I don't know. I've never been able to, to I've never, I, just the entire setup that we live in, this entire construct, just never felt right to me in the, anyway. So I, I don't know. Like, uh, but and it, would it work if we discovered a government's all tomorrow? Would it work? Mm -hmm. Or would it? I'm asking you. <laughs> wait, 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 say it again. What was the question? If we got rid of governments all tomorrow, would it work? You know, like. So, so okay, so that's another question that people pose to me is like, if there was a button that if you push it, the government would disappear. Would you push it? Or would that be a good thing, right? And um, my answer is it doesn't matter <laughs> because that's asserting that what's most important or what's really affecting us is the people, you know, on Capitol Hill, in the White House, you know, who comprise the House of Representatives, the Senate, you know, the Senate, you know, the people, the governors, the mayors. It's like those are the people that are the problem. That's what we have to deal with. And what I say is, no, they're not the problem. That's not the problem. They're the symptom of the problem. But yeah. the real question is, why are they there? And why do people believe that they're legitimate rulers? Right? Because the only way that they have any power is if people, the vast majority of the people who comprise the citizenry, the only reason they have power is because they believe them to have power. They have the the uh, ilu the uh, the idea of authority over the people, yeah. right? And they have to program that into you. Like, you yeah. Know, they have yeah. So so it doesn't like the buildings, you know, the tanks. That's that's not the problem. What I appeal to is the minds of the people. Once you begin to affect the minds of the people, and you begin to, they begin to understand what basic morality is. You know, self ownership, yeah. property yeah. rights. You know yeah. that that nobody has an exemption to morality. Once they begin to understand that. And more and more people accept it, uh, then that's when the true power of the state begins to erode, right? And so that's more important. So if you were to push this button, and let's say all the buildings would disappear, and all you know, I don't know, be, the president would disappear, or whatever, what would end up happening would be if the people still believe that they need a state to govern them, they will create it again. Because they're going to say, you know what? What happened to all of our buildings? The IRS is gone. The White House is gone. Oh, no. The Washington Monument is gone. Let's build another one. <laughs> Let's make it again because we need it. it. You, you haven't appealed to the minds of the people. That's so much more important than the physical, what we think of as the state. Yeah. Yeah. Because there, you, can, you can look at this. I, I can look at this in a couple of ways. Okay. Sharon, they did that. And then they found themselves in that situation. Yeah. We need something. Right. And the way they did it was just uh, through councils of elders and, and, and right. uh, community taking care of the volunteer. Volunteer. Right, right. That's a, that's definitely what, the way I see it. And Okay. I mean, but do you remember that vice special there where they went to, uh, where is it, that country in Africa where basically uh, after the slave trade was done, they went back and they put all the slaves back in their own country, the ones that wanted to go back. I, it was on vice. I forget what it's called. Um, but this place is in, was in horribly violent because basically the, the, when they got dropped off, they basically enslaved their own people that lived there and treated them what the way the slave master had treated them because that's what they knew. Mm. And it, what's that place called? Uh, I want to say Liberland or something. I mean, it's not Liberland, but uh, Liber, Liber, Liberia. Oh, Liberia. Liberia. Oh. Right? And like they, they're... They're vicious. They're like they. One guy will take over the last dictator and he'll eat him and <laughs> like alive. Like it's it's insane. The whole the whole show starts. This kid runs out of the like the parliament building or whatever with the guy's heart. And says I'm gonna eat this raw or something like that. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it's it's disturbing. So I haven't, you know, seen, like, I haven't seen that. <laughs> what you're saying is completely relevant. I don't think there's one answer, right? Like mm -hmm. if the governments all disappear tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You want to think that people would self-organize. I would be very interested to see how people do. Mm -hmm. How would people self-organize and how would things, you know, how long would it be before one guy gets to control a few and then starts to grow his little thing? And mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that the end of the day? Like, is not how the end uh, the situation we're in right now had to start somewhere, you know, and now there's very few that are controlling the whole thing. Well, I mean, that had to have started somewhere, right? Yeah. you know? And anarchy would have been the place, in a sense, or at least try, try like I mean, you got to bring it back to somewhere before this all. Ha 
So you, you, can you almost argue that the end result of capitalism would be total enslavement again? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, but yeah. that's that's up to the people to not let those people get. Yeah, I mean, that's the Lord of the Rings going against Sauron. I'm just, you know, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, 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 yeah. you know, the people have to. So that's what like Sharon did. They they were the David and Goliath. You know, hmm. they did they did that. Yeah, for real. You know, and. and and it worked, and they've been crime free ever since, and it's peaceful, and it's great, and the people are smiling, and the children are playing in the streets. <laughs> so, wait, so you're saying there, there not, there's no chaos and disorder without CPS down there, Child Protective Services? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> we we got to get the Child Protective Services down the shit on. You're not there's some, there's some, there's some, There's some kid, there's some, there's some, uh, what do you call it, unattended kids in the streets down there. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but listen, it's not like that. Like they did at one point, they came in with gunships and and hammered down a bunch of people there. Like, you know, but they still, they still, they won. Right. I mean, they, they, from what we understood, their kids were killed and stuff. Like it was. You know. Yeah, I mean that's the idea of non-aggression is that uh, you know they they certainly have they certainly understand the idea of self-defense and being armed and understanding that. You know, you know, um, force used in self defense is entirely justified, mm. right? Um, and which is a big difference. You know, people sometimes think they're indistinguishable self defense and the initiation of force. They think, oh, it's the same thing. No, no, big difference. You know, difference between a, you know, a, a man, you know, attempting to rape a woman and a woman defending herself. Big difference in between defensive force and the initiation of violence, right? So people, when they understand that concept, you know, they will see that no, the state, the state is always the initiator of aggression. In, yeah. You know, always. You know, every single law, tax, regulation, every single police encounter. You know, police pulling you over. He's not asking, "Can you please pull over?" To no, he's telling you, "If you don't pull over, I'm gonna call my friends." And we're gonna make you pull up, <laughs> you know. So there's no uh, there's no subtlety about the state whatsoever. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, for, for what I've seen, like I, my opinion really is the problem is with centralization in almost every case. I mean, at the very least, let's decentralize everything and, and start from there. You know what I mean? And right, right. Let the free markets have their reign, and and I think that would be best for everybody. I think uh, mm -hmm. we've probably had more technology suppressed from us. To, than we could ever even possibly imagine, you know. I, that's what. That's what. I, that's my. That's. It's. It's not even me a guessing. It's an educated guess, you know. And yeah. you really, if if, well, the see, yeah, like we need. To, if we want to progress as a people, like you put it, progress. Mm. That's the very first thing that has to go because I believe, like every year, we ought to be like, "Where's my flying car, man?" You know, like I've been waiting since grade. Six. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, why are we still running on oil? Like, why are we doing any of these things? Like, you know, this is ridiculous. Like, we don't need. I'm sure we don't need to be doing these things. But. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much potential that has been annihilated and destroyed by the course of arm of the state, you know, so much potential, um, that once, once it's, uh, you know, many industries that are, that are controlled and regulated by the state, once they begin to become freed up, you will see an explosion of innovation. You know, yeah. of, of potential. And how big is the state too? Because, you know, like we have, we had a hard time getting the cannabis legal because really these are UN treaties mm. around the world. Mm -hmm. What the, What's that all about? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's your one world government, I yeah, guess. Yeah. What is the state? I mean, when exactly. that one entity can make a, like, I don't, you know, like, come on. Everybody's just got to wake up. And, and, and what waking up means, like, is anybody's question right now? Because a lot of people are confused. Yeah. You know? Right. Definitely. There's a lot of people out there, like, they, they are com completely confused. Uh, that are totally like when I see how they repeat the narrative of whatever they heard on the news. Yeah. You know, if, if your if your mind works in absolutes, make a change because that's, you're not at the right answer somehow. I think, you know what I mean? Like mm. the answer never lies in black and white like that. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's true. 
So, but yeah, um, wonderful conversation. I don't want to pick, keep you too long, but uh, great conversation, um, Chris. So, uh, before we go, I uh, always ask my guests, um, what is your favorite quote of all time? You need rules to boil an egg. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Now is that is that uh, does that your quote or is that uh... that's Jacob Stoller Skol, Skoller my friend like I said he's from Denmark I don't know how to pronounce the name that's his quote and it's been with me all year I got a ton of favorite quotes yeah one the other day I heard one uh, it was one from Voltaire like uh, uh, a man is uh, every man is guilty of the of the good he hasn't done you know I like that one too ah I like that. The good he hasn't done. <laughs> so to add to Jacob's thing, it's like you need rules to you need rules to boil an egg, but you don't need sixty million friggin' policies, man. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's gotten boil. ridiculous and and uh, it's all gotta stop. You know, you can't you can't do it. Like I asked I asked in Canada, like I on Facebook, you know, what are you free to do in Canada? There's nothing. You need a you need a permit, literally, or a license to do any single thing. I can't think of nothing. Not one thing. Fishing, yeah. like nothing. <laughs> I think they even banned uh, the kids aren't even allowed to go down the hill on a, on a toboggan this year that where they used to go. <laughs> oh my gosh! Like, <laughs> it, 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 one of my favorite quotes uh, is, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, to the thinker. Um, to the thinker, the the world is a is a comedy, and to the uh, how does it go? Um, you know, it's like to the person who fe to the all oh, right to the person who feels the world is a tragedy. To the person who thinks the world is a comedy, <laughs> I like that because you gotta <laughs> it. like you, honestly, you gotta you gotta laugh at it. You gotta laugh at it. <laughs> if people could see this television show the way I do, I it's. it's yeah, you know, it's well. Actually, it's it's disturbing. So no. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta maintain your 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 levity, your humor. It's very it's vital to vital to uh, keeping your sanity. So, uh, so Chris, um, uh, before you go, can you reiterate your contact information so that people can, if they want to reach you or or, or contribute to you, uh, working? Uh, the best place is is on the Patreon page for now, and uh, hopefully by the time we have this up, we're going to have an Indiegogo and uh, those kind of things. Because really, this is what it, I, all I want to do with the rest of my life. Like I have no interest in working for mainstream anything, and it's been a long time, and uh, and this and that's where I've been going. And believe me, it's been a hard couple of years. And I mean, I give I'm, it is a good paying job, you know, like when you're doing it. But I mean, at this point, I'm ready. I, I want to be a filmmaker, telling my own stories. And uh, like somebody uh, said, you know, hey Chris, I want you to make this anti-pharmaceutical. Uh, I was like, you'll never get it out because I'm not interested in anti anything. Mm. We know the problems. We see the pilot problems. Let's talk about solutions. Yeah, great. Yeah, well, I'm trying to trying to help you get your word out, your message, and. Uh... Hopefully, people will support you. Visit your website. Visit your, or sorry, your your Facebook uh, pages, your uh, your Patreon, and uh, yeah, and you. We'll, we'll hopefully, we we'll have the Indiegogo uh, link when we post this uh, interview. So, Chris, thank you again for a wonderful conversation. Uh, really enjoyed it. So, this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on some next level podcast dot com on the SNLS network, uh, Voluntary Virtues Network. The Conscious Resistance Network and solpodcast.org. Uh, wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, PeacefulAnarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. 
if you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you will receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.